So welcome everyone tonight. Uh, my name is Anna Patalano and I'm the managing director of the Greenwich Art Society, which is an art center in Greenwich, Connecticut. And I'm very pleased to present uh, this evening's online book talk with James McElhenney, uh, who is our guest and the author of the newly published book, Sketchbook Traveler Southwest. Uh, joining Jim this evening will be Peter Trippi, who is the editor-in-chief of Fine Art Connoisseur, the national magazine that serves collectors of contemporary and historical realist art, and also president of Projects in 19th Century Art, a firm he established to pursue research and writing opportunities. Based in New York City, Peter previously directed the Dahesh Museum of Art, worked at the Brooklyn Museum and Baltimore Museum of Art, and co-curated international touring exhibitions devoted to J.W. Waterhouse and Lawrence Alma Tatama. His next projects are the 2024 loan exhibition Pre-Raphaelites Modern Renaissance in Forli, Italy, and a series of articles about fine art in the home of the poet Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, Cambridge, Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. And we also have joining us Catherine Manhorn, a professor of the history of art in the doctoral program at the Graduate Center of the City University of New York. Her focus is on art of the United States and Latin America. Dr. Manthorn is the author of Fidelia Bridges, Nature into Art, published by Lund Humphreys in London, 2023, Restless Enterprise, The Art and Life of Eliza Pratt, Greatero, I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing that, <laughs> published by University of California Press in 2020, Women in the Dark, Female Photographers in the U.S., 1850 to 1900, published in 2020, and Film and Modern American Art, released by Rutledge, Rutledge in softcover in 2020. Dr. Manthorn was recently appointed to the Scientifis Committee at the Musée d'Orsay in Paris. She will act as the moderator this evening and oversee the Q&A. I would like to uh, recommend to everyone who is... Um, Everyone coming in is on mute, and I would like to request that everyone remain muted throughout the presentation and the Q&A. Dr. Manthorn will be moderating the um, questions when you will be asked to submit questions for Jim. And, um, you know, just please respect that request. We appreciate that. So I'm going to turn it over to Jim. And uh, thank you for attending this evening. Thank you, everybody, for being here tonight. It's a pleasure to be with you and and to and to be in such august company. And uh, tonight, I'm going to unpack some of the details and backstory behind my new book, Sketchbook Traveler Southwest, which which you can see is in my hand. And uh, we're going to do this with an assist from a PowerPoint slide presentation, which I will commence now. So, Sketchbook Traveler Southwest began uh, as, um, well, the Sketchbook Traveler series, which, which is, is, will be a trilogy, uh, was a brainchild of a conversation I had with Joe Langman and Pete Schiffer about trying to do something to bring this idea of personal mobility and mindful engagement with nature through drawing and writing to, uh, a, to a public readership, a non-academic and uh, like a, a public-facing book. Uh, and the concept that came out of that meeting was a backpacker coffee table art book field guide. And so something that would fit uh, in a backpack or a messenger bag or something that would look well uh, on a pile of art books in, in uh, a fine home. So uh, we can see the pictures here uh, illustrating both uses. Let me see if I can get this. Here we go. Uh, so there are two books now. Sketchbook Traveler Hudson Valley was released uh, in during the, the pandemic in the fall of uh, 2020. And uh, it, of course, as the title would imply, 
explores sites along the Hudson Valley. Now, these are not just picture books. These also contain outtakes from my, my travel journals, observations, notes about the history and character of the places. And the whole idea being to really take a deep dive into this idea of place and location. Now, of course, the idea of, of sketchbook travelers is, is a very old one. We see artists like Albrecht Dürer, we see here uh, uh, Jean Delacroix, Turner, and others who are famous for their notebooks. I shouldn't leave out Leonardo, uh, but uh, whose perhaps notebooks are even more important than his paintings, uh, in my opinion. But I'm not going to focus on these well-known artists. We've all seen their works and we're all acquainted with them. I'm going to try to introduce you to some new people you may not have heard of that will um, uh, perhaps lead you down a different path. Uh, Jacques Lemoyne de Morgue was a friend, was a Franco Anglo French illustrator, scientist, naturalist, who uh, was one of the first trained artists uh, to come to what is now the United States. And he was part of an expedition to Florida. And these are a number of the, the images that he captured in the 1560s. John White, another another uh, gentleman artist who was the governor of the lost colony of Roanoke, uh, preserved some evidence of that colony and their interactions with indigenous people in eastern North Carolina, these marvelous watercolors that are in the collection of the British Museum. Thomas Davies was a British artillery officer who, like like all of his colleagues, the artillerists and engineers in the British Army, were trained in pictorial topographical drawing in an artistic way because the high command believed that if, if officers could be trained to describe terrain artistically, it would make them keener observers on the battlefield. And we can see here on the left is, is his sketch of the storming of Fort Washington, which is where the cloisters stand stands today the you know the cloisters um um uh, site owned and operated by the metropolitan museum of art and of course niagara falls on the right uh charles like, wilson peel is known to to all as as um as sort of the official artist of the american revolution but he was also uh, a naturalist and he did a wonderful sketchbook of the hudson valley on his way up to Montgomery, New York, where he excavated a mastodon. And uh, his son, T.R. Peel, uh, we, we see on the right, this image of a prairie dog from, from his time as uh, an artist naturalist with a long expedition of, two, of 1819 uh, to 1821. Another artist who was really inspiring to me is uh, Captain Joshua Rowley Watson, a wonderful book by Kathy Foster, who's a, uh, who's a curator at the Philadelphia Museum of, Philadelphia Museum of Art. Uh, and I love the fact that these, these paintings cross page spreads and have this wonderful horizontal panoramic format. Captain Watson was not a professional artist. He was a naval officer. And so this gives you the kind of an idea of what kind of skill level uh, existed among these gentlemen at that time. Another artist, Samuel Seymour, also accompanying the long expedition of 1819 to 1821, uh, a colleague of T.R. Peel, uh, portrayed a number of scenes along the Rocky Mountains, like the like the chasm of the Platte River, which we see here. Now, non-Western uh, arts uh, also uh, loom large in the idea of uh, a page spread as a substrate for painting. So here we have uh, a Fort Marion like a ledger book. And if you're acquainted with the history of these, 
These were done by captured Cheyenne and Arapaho warriors who were imprisoned in Florida. And in order to keep them occupied, the army gave them ledger books and 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 implements with which they could draw. And they filled them with these wonderful images of of a combat and life on the plains. Uh, Hokusai, of course, very, very, very prominent. Japanese artist uh, uh, was also known for his manga, a series of 14 albums of random sketches and views, genre scenes, mythological scenes, and landscapes su su such as we see here. Uh, Heinrich Baldwin Mulhausen was an artist who accompanied uh, who accompanied military surveys of the West, as was Seth Eastman, who was actually, for a brief time, the head of the Drawing Academy at West Point, and, and, and a published author and a, uh, an honorary member of the National Academy of Design. We also have artists like Richard Kern. People have not heard of Richard Kern. He's very obscure, but wonderful artist who accompanied John C. Fremont and other explorers of the far west in the years after the Mexican War. And here we see a view from Taos. This is, this is an area of the country that, that is explored in my book, Southwest Travel, or Sketchbook Traveler Southwest. Here's another uh, Kern, a view of the Placer or the Ortiz Mountains. You can see the 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 hump in the back is you know the Sandia Peak, which is which is which is next to Albuquerque, New Mexico today. And of course, Adrian Wilson, who was the artist who accompanied the uh, Robert Falcon Scott uh, expedition, which which uh, which ended tra tragically in, in all of its members perishing just a day away from from uh, from safety. And of course, I wanted to include a few other sort of unlikely people like J.B. Jackson, the father of American landscape theory on the left, uh, who also kept sketchbooks and was a was a tireless traveler and the architect louis i Kahn, we see on the right uh, who who was also uh, a, uh, a prolific uh, uh artist when he was traveling i mean a lot of architects you we imagine that architects have a very technical approach to design i remember when i when we went to the opening of the Hamilton Wing at the Denver Art Museum, I spoke to uh, the architect Daniel Liebskind, who was the building's designer, and asked him if he used AutoCAD and all of that. He said, oh, no, no, not in design. We have technicians for that. He said, we use we use watercolor ink. Everything was just, you know, everything's made by hand in, in that initial design process. And I think that's important that that drawing and painting are not just image production methods, they're also ways of thinking. And this is uh, from a sketchbook at the Met of a trip to Chateau de by uh, uh, an architect employed by Napoleon. And William Henry Holmes, another expeditionary artist, naturalist. And these are interesting drawings because you have two stacked panoramas. And really, it's about the data. It's really not art for the salon or for the parlor. It's art in the service of knowledge. And here's one of his views of the Grand Canyon. And of course, Samuel Coleman. Uh, There's a wonderful painting at the uh, at you know, Hudson River Museum, a view of Yonkers. Uh, again, this horizontal format, which which harkens back to the idea of an open page spread. So there we have uh, it. May I just chime in to say sure. thank you for that fantastic whistle stop 
overview of the precedents, I think that's really helpful. Uh, because first of all, as you said, some of your choices are not familiar to many of us today, and therefore I really appreciate your having selected them, but also it really sets into context what you're about to address in the new publication. Thank you. Yeah, uh, I, it, it was a learning process for me because like a lot of my colleagues, I mean, I was trained as a studio artist. I went to Tyler School of Arts, Skowhegan and Yale, and I was I was... I was weaned, nursed on uh, art critical formalism and the idea that the the story of the art was the critical analysis of the art. And I, I have I have moved away from that position, and I found myself very, very interested. Of course, there are hundreds of these artists who are not really part of the canon, and I believe they should be. And I recently wrote an article for the Hudson River Valley Review in which I revealed that engravings of North America based on drawings by British military officers preceded the publication of Claude Lorraine's Liber Veritatis by 12 years. Mm -hmm. So that kind of overturns the whole idea that it's this linear progression. Of course, as Claude, like Richard Wilson, so forth. But that's the very rarefied realm of the sort of parlor salon artist you know who is who is exhibiting uh in official venues and is is being uh, is being empowered by wealthy patrons and and these other artists are really in like working in the service of of the increase of knowledge yes and that i think is very important i think the 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 place where all of these these realms overlap science history art travel uh they all overlap uh in the printer's office because map makers naturalists topographical artists fine artists salon artists parlor artists they're all meeting at the printer's shop and it was sort of like the internet of the 18th century. <laughs> and once I realized that, I thought, wow, this is really interesting. And of course, my 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 own practice, apart from painting in sketchbooks, is is to unpack these these images and ideas as intaglio prints and as archival pigment prints, and in often in like limited editions. Well. You have broken fresh ground in that area, James. Uh, that's something that you and I have talked about before, and we've covered editorially in, in Fun Art Connoisseur. Uh, right. That's exciting to see how you've made that work as well, uh, because I think it's important that we put great imagery in front of people in many different formats, not just in the salon or in the Chelsea Gallery. Uh, there are many ways for people to absorb Exactly. And I think as many artists are complaining about the monetization of the fashionable art world, shutting a lot of people out, especially representational art, um, in a way, it's a golden opportunity to, you know, to blaze new trails and to, uh, to open up old ones, which is what I think I'm doing. I mean, I'm actually following a 200 year old playbook i love it I didn't, the old. I, I didn't just i didn't just invent it i just like revived it and, and and i'm not alone there are other people there's a wonderful artist who lives in cornwall named uh england named uh tony foster who is an incredible artist and and uh um a real a real force and and and, and uh his work is not as widely known as it should be, but but there is a museum devoted to him now in Palo Alto. So I think I think he'll be on the radar more and more. There's so, someone else we've covered recently. Uh, he's just tremendous. I'm glad you mentioned him. So I want to I want to just read an excerpt from the book to give everybody an idea of of what kind of. Uh, content they're going to find in the book. And then what we'll do is we'll go through a series of page spreads that will give people of sketchbook traveler 
Southwest. I mean, it's I could hold up the book, but it won't really work. So I've got slides. Let me give you a little preview here like this. But um, we'll go through those and and I'll uh, and I'll tell a few stories. So <clears throat> now this is the reading part. Following the Civil War, professional studio artists began to seek inspiration in the West. <clears throat> yeah, published by George Putnam in New York, Eliza Pratt, Greater X's, 1873 Summer Etchings in Colorado, was one of the first books by a woman to propose a grand tour of, the tra of trans Mississippi, North America. Hudson River School artists like Albert Bierstadt, John Kensett, and Worthington Whitridge tramped across the plains and into the Rockies. Thomas Moran's paintings of Yellowstone and the Grand Canyon helped sell the idea of national parks to the U.S. Congress. Working in concert with the Atchison, Topeka, and Santa Fe Railroad, Fred Harvey opened a, established a new brand of mobile hospitality, building modern hotels near train stations and running motor tours to bring travelers in contact with native artists selling jewelry, pottery, and weavings. By the turn of the 19th century, artists were moving to we're moving to Taos and Santa Fe, some for the scenery and brilliant sunlight, while others sought relief from tuberculosis in the clean mountain air. Artists who formed the core of the Taos art colony in the early 20th century celebrated the spectacle of nearby mountains and canyons, at the same time producing genre scenes of the native Puebloan community. With in a few years, artists from New York, like John Sloan, Marsden Hartley, and John Marin, would make seasonal trips to northern New Mexico. Others who flocked to Taos included Ansel Adams, D.H. Lawrence, and Georgia O'Keeffe. The Southwest continues to attract artists, hikers, anglers, and sportsmen to test their mettle against the rugged conditions of a still forbidding wilderness. In places where mortal peril attends every step in the form of violent weather, wildlife, rock falls, and avalanches, one is naturally inclined towards mindfulness. <laughs> so confronting the sublime teaches us to respect and revere nature. In many ways, the West is America, with its breathtaking terrain, enchanting beauty, and aggregate culture, Few places are more American than the Southwest. Having once experienced it, some part of it remains with us wherever else we may go. Such is its beauty, power, and allure. In the words of 19th century traveler Isabella, Isabella Lucy Bird, I have found a dream of beauty at which one might look all one's life and sigh. D.H. Lawrence put it thus, quote, in the magnificent, fierce morning of New Mexico, one sprang awake, a new part of the soul woke up and suddenly, and the old world gave way to a new, unquote. Reckoning all of my separate trips to the Southwest over the years, I must have spent years exploring its rivers and mountains, historic sites and byways. The only direction from which I have yet to approach the region is from the south. Most historic trade routes and itineraries, followed by historic expeditions, have been leveled and paved for, the, for automotive use. One exception is the Medano Pass, where Zebulon Pike and his party crossed over the Blanca Mountains in southern Colorado. Those who have yet to visit the region might be taken aback by the weather. Contrary to Hollywood visions of sunny days and golden vistas, one might wake up to snow, play golf after breakfast, and go skiing in the afternoon. The high desert and mountainous regions receive heavy snowfall in the winter and blistering heat in the summer. My first trip to the Grand Canyon was during a blizzard. Elevation seemed to be a determining factor. 
South rim of the Grand Canyon stands at nearly 7,000 feet. The north rim is almost 2,000 feet higher in elevation. El Paso sits at 3,740 feet, while Los Alamos is 7,320. So the San Andreas Fault runs the length of the Quachea Valley, which is more than 230 feet. To, pardon me. More than 2,500 feet below nearby Joshua Tree National Park. Stretching 50 miles southward, the valley descends more than 200 feet to the Salton Sea, which lies barely above sea level. So the Southwest is a land of extremes. Its varied climate may be attributed to the combined forces of volcanic and plate tectonics that have shaped the terrain, watered largely by snowmelt in the high country. So, I mean, you know, the book try is is is, is a personal it's a personal ode, if you will, to the region, and. Um, um was well, a wonderful I, I want to say you, you've created a picture in words for us uh which is very appreciated uh i think that's so appropriate in the context of this publication well making pictures that still tell stories also requires that one uh paint pictures with words yeah going back and forth so that there's a conversation between the visual language and the verbal language or the written language and and my approach to writing i i spoke for many many years i did i i like to say i did stand up for decades in higher ed as a lecturer and as a <laughs> studio art teacher and a lot of it was sort of extemporaneous lecturing but then also with writing like one of the things I do is read everything aloud to hear how it sounds to 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 try to discover you know the music in the words Good. and the imagery that they can um, summon up and uh, you know also there are episodes uh, certain experiences that I had uh, that are unpacked uh, here and there throughout the text which which as you can tell are peppered with um with quotes by people but you know who either like writers or explorers who have had contact with the region there's a great quote by Willa Cather I have to find elsewhere the sky is the roof of the world but here the earth was the floor of the sky Death comes to the archbishop. That's right. Rather. Well, I, I was giggling a little when you uh, finished uh, a passage with the word mindfulness, uh, because I remember encountering very severe weather in that region that is so making you mindful of the fact that you could be dead in five minutes. Uh, right. It is extraordinary how serene everything looks and then it's not. Uh, and you are out there on your own against nature. Um, you know, you can have an umbrella. It's not going to do any good. Uh, and I am totally mindful of that um, when I'm there. So you, you've encountered much worse than I have, I'm sure. So I'll read a little bit more. La Tierra Encantada, the land of enchantment, is also La Tierra Embrujada, the haunted land. In the twilight desolation of a mesa top, the presence of spirits angels and shapeshifters seem possible. Beneath a canopy of stars, one has the sense of standing atop a living thing with a mind, a soul, and a beating heart. This notion of a living earth has made the Southwest a magnet for escapees from modern society. Ethnographer Frank Hamilton Cushing lived as part of the Zuni Pueblo from 1879 to 1884. His books and articles illuminated and demystified Puebloan life, culture, and spirituality. 
Frank Waters' book of the Hopi appeared at a time when many Americans had lost faith in the American dream, the height of the Vietnam era, opting for alternative lifestyles. Books by Edward Abbey and Carlos Castaneda were on every counterculture bookshelf. Tony Hillerman's popular crime novels blend Diné mysticism with hard-boiled thrillers. But now a growing population now strains natural resources in ways that, that are clearly unsustainable. In an attempt to dissuade miners from prospecting in Boulder Valley before the Civil War, Chief Niwat of the Southern Cheyenne Nation predicted that, quote, people seeing the beauty of this valley will want to stay, and their staying will be the undoing of this beauty. Chief Niwat's curse, famous to everyone in Colorado, most people at least, considering the calamitous fate of the Chakwin culture and our own shabby track record, one wonders if environmental disaster can be delayed or prevented. Artists were among the first to depict many of these natural wonders. Let them be the first to preserve them. This can be accomplished in a number of ways. The first step is to promote environmental awareness. And this book is an attempt to encourage people to get outdoors and engage with nature by picking up a pencil or a brush. Reviving the true spirit of expeditionary art demands that we venture out beyond the recreational pleasures of hiking, camping, and plein air painting by researching our subjects before heading into the wild. The more knowledge we possess of the history of the places we visit, the more mindful we will be of their peoples and cultures. Likewise, the better under our understanding of its geology, climate, flora, and fauna, the more thoroughly we can comprehend all that we behold. The goal is not to produce works of art, but to deepen our connection to our surroundings in ways that, that transform experience into knowledge and ideas. Well put, absolutely. So, um, I, I mean, I hope people attending are typing questions furiously into the chat so that we'll <laughs> be able to address them shortly. So at this point, I would like to share a couple of these page spreads. So the book is broken up into basically four sections. The first is a series of short essays addressing the history, the nature, the science, and the art of the region. The second is a gallery in print, which we can see here. And um, uh, this is a, a kind of a, an amusing image, which uh, has a story. So I'll read you the caption for this. It's only a couple hundred words. Drawn to maps from an early age, I am fascinated by ancient cartography. Framed with scenes of faraway places, old maps might feature exotic natives in colorful garb and sea monsters like licking their margins. Delineated in Hashur's strata of elevation were rendered in radiating pen strokes. Hills and mountains seemed to jump off the page, like the vacuum formed plastic relief maps that adorned many schoolroom walls. Mapping and surveying are fundamental to expeditionary practice. In journal painting, I will sometimes use the book Gutter as my line of sight aiming device, recording the compass heading in the margins of the drawing. On road trips following tight schedules, there is no time to stop and sketch. Sitting in a motel at day's end, I might produce a map to record the day's process. And this practice began years ago with marking up road maps purchased at service stations and picked up at welcome centers. The fluorescent Markers highlighted my roots. Incidents of travel were recorded, were recorded in scrawling marginalia. During lunch at a diner on Route 66, the placemat caught my eye. 
crawling from corner to corner across the scallop sheet, the legendary highway was dotted with stopping points, flanked by texts and vignettes of scenic attractions. Besmirched with coffee stains and biscuit gravy, my placemat was a goner. The waitress brought me a fresh one. Pushing my dishes aside, I made a few notes. Unfolding it later that night, I transferred lunchtime scribbles into my sketchbook. Almost by chance, my practice had grown, inspired by a placemat. <laughs> Fantastic. I love oh. it. That's uh, so in sync with the, um, the little squiggle on a cocktail napkin that becomes a, a major monument or uh, edifice. <laughs> Let me find another image. I think we have a little more. I'll do one more image and we'll uh, move to the Q&A. Well, I, I should point out one thing, James, and that would be this, that, that I'd love your thoughts on whether we are now at risk of losing a generation or two or more in the world of maps <clears throat> because so many people now use GPS. They don't hold something in their hand as they're moving through space. They're basically following instructions. I th I think that's I think that's true, and I think it's the same kind of loss that is going to be caused by people's inability to write by hand. Yeah, you know, texting it. It's by only keyboarding, you are losing uh, an enormous amount of sensory, haptic, visual, cognitive, um, yeah. mind sharpening. Yeah. And and it'll take a long time for the effects to present, but they they uh, they will. So anyway, also in the book, let me just uh, is a section, an instructional section that explains kind of how to lay out an image in easy steps. It's not technique; it's method. It's the difference between a technique and a method, or a technique and a strategy. So this is more of a of a playbook for sort of how to look at 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 a subject and then translate it into a graphic idea and then speaking about historical artists like claude loran and of course baldwin mulhausen um and let me get to the image i want to talk about here we go running between the northern llanos estacados of new mexico and tres piedras U.S. Highway 64 crosses a broad volcanic field, reaching from the Sangre de Cristo Mountains in the east to the Tusas Range in the west. Situated at the northern end of the Española Basin of the Rio Grande Rift, the Taos Plateau is punctuated by a number of extinct volcanic cones and lava domes. The most recent major eruptions were roughly 40,000 years ago, rising to the surface Geothermal waters have been utilized by a number of spa resorts from Jemez Hot Springs to Ojo Caliente, to the Rocky Mountains of Colorado and the Yellowstone Caldera in northwestern Wyoming. Sufficient geothermal activity may exist for it to be harnessed in certain locations as a renewable source of energy. Taos Plateau is traversed from north to south by the Rio Grande Gorge cutting a deep slash through the more than 700 feet of vol volcanoclastic sediment. Archaeological evidence indicates a human presence in the region for more than 11,000 years. So prior to the completion of the high bridge in 1965, river crossings involved a descent into the gorge via tributaries such as the Red River of New Mexico, Arroyo Hondo, and Rio Pueblo de Taos. Having visited the span on numerous occasions, I never stopped to tire of its vistas. Scorning local ordnance, art, artisans from Taos Pueblo set up tables on the shoulder of the highway. Turning a blind eye to these vendors on most days, cops might shut them down anytime just to remind them who's in charge. A day or two later, the little roadside market will be back in business. And uh, I should add, 
that this is my rattlesnake encounter in Joshua Tree. I won't leave time for the Q&A. But my work was also, I was totally surprised by this. My work was also included in a book that was published by the Denver Art Museum last fall called The American West in Art. It's a wonderful, sprawling history of Western art. And uh, uh, Erica Doss, who is a, uh, who is a uh, an Americanist, a professor of American studies at University of Notre Dame, wrote a wonderful essay about uh, about the contemporary artists who were engaged in this in this um, genre. And uh, I was very, very honored to be included. And this is the painting that's in the collection of the Denver Art Museum. I include it because <clears throat> it's a painting of a battlefield, and actually <clears throat> it, it presages a lot of the sketchbook work yeah, because in the sky and elsewhere there are traces of writing. And, uh, and, and it was really one of the first paintings that I did where I was uh, um, really, really mindful of sort of the topographical heritage of of um of this approach to painting well here again in this image we have word and image together uh right. which is kind of exciting i mean that's just who you are uh and also i think just to say that your texts are so delightful because they are not overly scientific or descriptive they are a perfect medley of knowledge, as you said earlier, but also personal experience and even down to anecdote, such as the roadside selling um, on the highway. I, I love that because that's exactly part of the experience that th these things are all happening around you. There's this amazing nature and there are also people living their lives. And you flag that beautifully. Well, thank you. I mean, that's it's important to me that this process, and I guess I realized in hindsight that a lot of what motivated me to paint in the first place was curiosity and a desire to increase knowledge, my knowledge. And then I, I, I'm now beginning to feel like I need to make art that is, is about the increase of knowledge and is in pursuit of knowledge. And, and, and so all of the research, the travel, the drawing, the writing, it all comes together in that. And it's, it's about the practice. It's not about the style. It's not about the technique. It's not about the craft. I paint in watercolor just because it's the easiest medium to use for if you if you're if you're painting in a sketchbook i mean it's yeah. really the only medium you can use so uh and as you can see in this painting i'm standing there on the right self-portrait with my french easel i don't carry a french easel anymore i just carry a sketchbook in a watercolor box and That's actually easy. tony foster who does these three by four foot paintings and larger I asked him what he painted with, what he took into the field, what he's he's doing these giant paintings. He's doing them with a Windsor Newton bijou box and a Tupperware lid. That's it. <laughs> Love it. Love it. Okay, Love let's let's it. let's do some QA. Well, James, that was very stimulating. I think we all want to jump into our cars or hop on a plane and and go and see some of these places for ourselves. Um I always learn something when I hear you speak. Uh, so I think the first question that would be useful to start with is what challenges did you face in the Southwest that differed from the Hudson Valley? And um, to follow up on that, sort of how, how important is familiarity with place? I mean, you live in New York, um, you've, you've talked about you know visiting the Southwest quite a bit. So how does that, factor into your uh treatment of the subjects well i think i think it's an <clears throat> it's an important um <clears throat> that that we all identify with specific places in one way or another and i think it whether it has to do with where you grew up or where you've lived in the past and i've had a very peripatetic life i've lived all over the united states and uh i've been going to the southwest since 1979 so uh, it's both, <clears throat> I've never actually lived there full time, but it's very familiar to me. Um, 
But I think the answer to that question goes back to, uh, well, the Simon Sharma book, uh, you know, um, uh, what's it called? Landscape and Memory, which, which, which talks about, um, about how, how identity can be formed by a sense of place. And it's a deep, it's a deep subject, but I think it's definitely part of it. And I think for me, when I go someplace new, it's I have this hunger to know everything about it. So I read, you know, I read books, I read the history, I look at the natural history. Uh, I, you know, I, I try to understand, you know, the geology that shaped the terrain and, um, and then go there and interact with it. You know, it's, it's kind of like online dating, you know, you do all of the research and then you finally meet the person, you know, and it's, I, I think if you have done your homework, you probably have a, a more pleasant experience. So so can you follow up then on the distinction with the Hudson Valley? I oh, thought Hudson that was Valley? a very important question from Kathy, the, the, this idea of regions having their own feeling. Especially since volume one was the Hudson Valley. <laughs> so um, the Hudson Valley, of course, is uh, the canonical American landscape, uh, although that that history is being rewritten by people like Anna Marley in Philadelphia, who successfully argued that the print culture in Philadelphia, out of which Thomas Cole emerged, laid the groundwork. And of course, I'm arguing that that print culture was built on military topographical drawing at the end of the French and Indian War. So the start clock gets pushed, keeps getting pushed back further and further. Uh, but with the Hudson Valley, yeah, again, uh, it's, I think with both the Southwest and the Hudson Valley, any artist who tackles those subjects is going to be competing with the ghosts of, of artists who've been there before, because they're both places that have been uh, thoroughly explored by professional artists. And so it's not like you're going to find something new. Maybe you will, but probably not, you know, from whether you're starting with William Guy Wall and Milbert and, and the early uh, sort of travel artists on up to Thomas Cole and, and Church and the rest. It's, you know, you know, to paint the Hudson Valley, you are walking among ghosts. You're walking with ghosts, you know, they're, they're right there with you and and uh they haunt your process same thing happens with the southwest although like you said with the southwest there is this sense of peril that doesn't exist in the same way like you could die in this canyon and no one would find they would find your mummified corpse a hundred years from now <laughs> it's very possible well, just to follow up on that a little bit more, um, you opened up with the historical expeditionary artists. Uh, so obviously, you know, you, you wanted to lay that groundwork. So maybe you could talk a little bit more about how that dialogue with these ghosts, as you put it, really works. I mean, um, are you thinking about their compositions? Do you go to places that they that they visited? Like what, what to what degree are you actually in dialogue with them? I, I don't, I will, with the, with the Rio Grande project, which is, I guess, still ongoing, uh, I made my own choices about which locations uh, to visit and paint. And, but as I would do research, I would, f I would find that uh, other artists had been there first, and then I would look at the work they did. And there was an interesting thing I realized especially in the case of Richard Kern, who, by the way, was killed by Native Americans in Utah in 1854. But uh, so he really did have a perilous experience. But uh, was his view from Fort Marcy, which is just behind north of Santa Fe, at the northern edge of Santa Fe. And he's exaggerating all of these features of terrain, which would be just specks on the horizon. But he's making, he's, He's uh, he's juicing them all with steroids to make them 
readily identifiable to travelers so the so the purpose of his drawing was not as an expressive work of art but was as a as a guide to people who would be looking at a map and saying oh what's this look like and what's that look like and there it is but if you actually were to stand there and try to see those sites the way he portrayed them you you know they're just not there so it's uh you know there's a, lo a lot of things that artists were doing of course even the the uh, studio artists or parlor artists or or people like church and cole were exaggerating uh you know the size of mountains and so forth for aesthetic effect you know church's painting of kayambi kayambi would need to be twice the size of everest for it to look that way so i want to answer a couple more questions if there are any so i don't want to leave anybody out and i don't want to uh i don't want to run too long all right so how about um another question that came up is i mean you mentioned mindful engagement with nature and that we should all run out with our pencils and our brushes but how does that really uh translate into you know environmental awareness can you elaborate a little bit more on that well let's put it this way i've seen people you know they they go to the south rim of the grand canyon they pull up they jump out of their car they take a few snapshots and then they head for the bar at the el tovar lodge that what have they learned nothing it was like i was here you know uh now i'm thirsty so i think if 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 you bring a journal and you write or you draw and even if your drawing looks like mickey mouse and not like the grand canyon you're going to get more out of that experience because it's a way of slowing yourself down and paying attention to what you behold and it's not about collecting items for the bucket list it's about finding a connection you know finding a connection building a memory like i said doing something that transforms experience into knowledge and ideas driving somewhere taking a photograph and going to a restaurant doesn't transform the experience of the related location to into knowledge and ideas uh i think you know if you go for a hike or go for a walk i mean read read the writings of john muir john burroughs and and uh who wrote something beautiful about the art of seeing things essay called it's called the art of seeing things he says what we love to do we do well and he says knowing something is only half the other half is love mm -hmm. so the challenge is when you go to a site with a specific purpose of visiting it spend some time with it you know plan to spend the day there go for a walk bring a notebook if you're not confident about your drawing skills it it doesn't matter it you know you could you could be scribbling because it it's been shown that if if you uh well hillary clinton remember hillary clinton got you know she caught hell for doodling at the un well turns out the science says that if you're engaged in one sensory activity and doing another it makes the primary experience it turns it into a more durable memory so in other words it it, it didn't matter actually doodling was an ed de memoir and so it doesn't matter what you do i mean you you know you can take photographs but the difference between taking a photograph really taking a photograph and uh drawing is i mean it's not much it takes basically the same amount of time because you have to sit there and look at what it what you know the subject has to offer you have to you have to discover a composition you have to look at the light you have to decide when you're going to make your exposure you have to decide on iso f-stop shutter speed all that stuff 
Hmm. And we're, uh, we're living in a world of selfie tourism, however, right. where that idea of go quickly go uh, is very much in the ascendancy. And, and so this book of yours, this way of thinking is really transgressive and provocative and exciting because we're asking people to slow down. Maybe uh, should be. not a whole lot slower, but slower oh. than what they're used to. And well, that's maybe, thrilling. Maybe I should maybe I should be more aggressive and say it's an antidote to the Anthropocene. There we go. The the solipsistic uh the sol the wor world of solipsistic distractions. Yeah. Where in in other words, get over yourself, go out and discover something. Uh, and and you'll be transformed by that experience. You'll be elevated by that experience. And you'll be improved by that experience. And I I, I actually believe it'll make you a better person. You know, uh, the the uh, MacArthur Prize winning AIDS researcher. Uh, um, um, oh, I'm not having a moment here, but but uh, Robert Root Bernstein said. Scientists who make art make better science than science who, scientists who don't. Absolutely, so it's not about it's not about making art. It's about increasing knowledge. It's about about increasing your powers of observation, growing your attention span. This and, is why art has been incorporated into medical school curricula now. I mean, every really? medical school is demanding that students do this. So that's exactly. To your point, I'm delighted that running parallel to the selfie tourism world is seemingly a world of mindfulness where we're hearing more and more about people wanting to slow down and go to spas, go to the Amman hotels and spend $4,000 a night in a beautiful place just looking at the property. That's a good thing. Uh, you know, whether you have $4,000 or not is not the point. Uh, the fact is that um, it is something that we need to encourage, and your books definitely will help. That's the hope. That's my hope. I'm, I'm not interested in polemics of style or cults of virtuosity or tribes of technique. I'm interested in, in how the practice of drawing, painting, writing, and, and, and photography even could, could, could uh, help increase environmental awareness and through that self-awareness and I, I think i think i think it's a good it's a it's a good message and it's not about me it's not about me it's not about you know i don't want to be picasso i don't want to be julian schnabel i don't want to be an art star you know it's not that doesn't interest me I'd, I'd rather, I mean, I spent a lot of years as an educator and I would rather motivate people um, to find to find ways of uh, deepening their engagement with the world around them and with, with you know, the people around them. Brilliant. I'm ready to go to the Southwest again. I've got my Me book. Me too. Me too. <laughs> Doing a monoprint marathon in march i'm thinking about going so but uh, uh one final question okay. uh you mentioned this is a trilogy so what's part three new england it's already in the can it's already with a printer uh we're looking at cover designs it'll be out next fall and they've they've done Schiffer publishing has done a really terrific job uh really innovative i mean they're really clever you know the book has this little strap on it so it's like a like a notebook and it also i didn't include these in the slides it also has a section of blank pages with inspirational quotes like you see this looks like a blank page but actually i don't know if you can see there's a you know yep. i'm just going to read this one an author knows his landscape. An, an author knows his landscape best. He can stand around, smell the wind, 
and get a feel for his place. So there's your answer to the question of how does the sense of place? Tony Hillerman, who, who everybody may know through his Lee Porn Chi Navajo mystery novels. So wonderful writer. And well, James, uh, congratulations. Uh, it's thrilling you. to see this emerge uh, and another on the way. Well, I'm in your debt for for all your support and for your confidence in these projects and and uh, and of course to to Kathy, who has been a a, a pillar and support and uh, uh, inspiration every day. and Joe Langman uh, at Schiffer and Pete Schiffer and uh, so many other people too. I mean, I'm not going to make an Oscar speech here, but I could. And here's Anna Padalano to wish us a good evening. Ah, I'm so sorry I had to step away. Uh, Jim, go ahead and um, uh, did you wrap up everything? Did you get your well, question? Well, pretty much the only thing I need to do uh, to put a smile on the publisher's face is to is to do a pitch and say, anyone on this Zoom or watching this film, uh, once it's on YouTube, uh, can point their phone at that QR code that'll take them right to the order portal on Schiffer Publishing. Of course, you could go to Amazon or BNN or any one of a number of other online retail. Even Target and Walmart are carrying it. Oh my God. But that's great. But anyway, it's a uh the price is $24.95. Um and like I said, I, I couldn't be happier with with you know the design and the production values, which are it's a really they're really two gorgeous books, and I'm 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 so uh, honored to be uh, working with s such a, a terrific outfit. I should say that Schiffer Publishing is a small family owned. A uh, house in in Atlin, Pennsylvania, in Lancaster County, or is it Chester County border? Anyway, uh, out in Pennsylvania, Dutch country, and it, it it has for years been a well known niche publisher of antiques and and uh, you know, the decorative arts, but has expanded over the years, and they have just such a terrific line of titles and great yes. crew, terrific to work with. Thanks, James. Same. We we've, we've enjoyed working with you. Well, it's uh, onward and upward. So we'll <laughs> here comes New England. So Anna, thank you, and the Greenwich Art uh, Society. Well, you're very welcome. It was my pleasure to host you this evening, and uh, great to see Peter again. And so happy to have been introduced to uh, Kathy. And uh, thank you everyone for attending. And uh, just a quick pitch that if you don't know, the Greenwich Art Society is one of the oldest art artist run organizations in Lower Fairfield County. And uh, at its inception was founded by several prominent members of the Cost Cobb Colony of Artists. And uh, right along the lines of uh, plein air uh, painting and uh, the consideration of their surrounding landscape, um, you know, we, we, we kind of like have a, a lot to, uh, a strong legacy to carry on. So um, it's my pleasure to know Jim and his work. And I think it's very important work. And anytime we can collaborate with him, we're very happy to do so. Thank you for your support and the your confidence in my mission. No, not at all. We, we, uh, we enjoy having you and uh, hope we can do something again very soon. Anybody who wants to get in touch with me personally, uh, it's very easy. It's just james at mcelhinneyart.com.